be in the book of Jeremiah today, but also 2 Chronicles. So the book of Jeremiah, and then also 2 Chronicles. So if you want to put your finger in both directions, uh, that will be helpful to you as we're going to switch between the two books uh, to get the overarching themes here. Uh, book of 2 Chronicles is a uh, book that tells us about what happens during the book of Jeremiah somewhat. And so we're going to pick up both of those along the way. But Jeremiah, and we're going to look at the content of the book, so all 52 chapters, but uh, fear not, not all at once. We'll be in part two next week uh, considering how God requires heart replacement and not reform. Book of Jeremiah today. Let's begin together in prayer and ask God to work in our hearts as we look at his word. Father, we come to you and are grateful to be together where we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are God. You are loving, forgiving, gracious, and merciful God. And though you require a replacement of our hearts, our hearts that are broken and stony and so idolatrous, that you provide it through the new covenant. Or I pray that we would ask you and readily accept you to search our hearts today. That we would know for sure whether or not we are under the new covenant and that we have been had our hearts replaced with hearts that love you. Or challenge us today, work in our hearts. Open our eyes to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Jeremiah is not a happy book. Jeremiah also penned the book of Lamentations, and rightly so. He's called uh, the weeping prophet. And something that we see as we connect the book of Jeremiah with the book of the historical records of the kings of Judah and 2 Chronicles is this question that we even face today. A question of whether or not national reform and a change in leadership can truly change the course of a nation And through that change of the nation, prevent the judgment of God. So we should ask ourselves, what does the Bible, especially here in these books, say about this? How does the example of Judah and her continual change of leadership, sometimes for the better, describe and show us what happens? If it's possible for a nation through leadership change, to return to God. You know, Judah, after the division of the kingdom, had an almost alternating series of bad and good kings. The good kings often brought reform and often returned to worshiping God. The bad kings set up idols and led the people into indulging in their idolatrous desires. And within this pattern, this alternating pattern, we see that though the good kings of Judah, like Josiah of Jeremiah's day, brought good reforms, reform did not hold off the judgment of God. Reform was not enough. Just as reform is not enough on the national level, so it is insufficient on the personal level. The message of the book of Jeremiah is that God requires a replacement of our hearts, not reformation. So consider today how God, who is merciful and gracious, requires replacement, heart replacement, and not reform. 
And really, the, the message of the book of Jeremiah begins in this second book of Chronicles, in chapters 33 to 36. And this is described here uh, and connected to by the first verses of the book of Jeremiah, which says the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in uh, Anathoth in the land of ben Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoiah, Josiah, king of Judah. And we have here, even from the king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. These verses place for us the, reign, the, the ministry of Jeremiah within these reigns of the kings. Did you notice Jeremiah here is one of the priests? And God calls him, even in the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, to a very difficult ministry. Something we won't get into today, but I, I challenge you, read, read God's call on Jeremiah and how God tells them, go, I'm going to send my word with you, and they're not going to listen. It's a difficult ministry he's called to, and yet God does that. But here we have the, the ministry of Jeremiah during the reign of these kings, and these kings reigned... And their reign is chronicled in the book of 2 Chronicles and beginning in chapter 33 and the first verse there, the Josiah's predecessor, Manasseh. And this is how the kingdom is when Jeremiah comes on the scene. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But notice what his reign it is described as. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. He led as king the nation of Judah into the idolatry of the people who were cast out and destroyed by God when Israel took the land. The worship of Molech and Ammon, the burning of children, to gods, to false idols. Manasseh, this was his reign. Notice he built the high places that, is, that his father Hezekiah had broke down. His father was a good king. Apparently Manasseh wasn't paying attention to the lessons of dad. And the very places that Hezekiah had pulled down, these places of idol worship, Manasseh rebuilt. And there he erects altars to the Baals and made Asheroth and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall be my name forever. He goes and he builds altars to the Baals in the temple of God. Manasseh, if, uh, of the many kings, if that God was going to strike one dead with lightning, he would be in the running. He would be at the forefront of the list uh, of being struck down dead very quickly because of his actions. Not only is he personally idolatrous, but then he is leading the people to do the same he is bringing to them and, and fulfilling their desires for this idol worship, even defiling the temple of God. It would be like if here, if we had come in this afternoon and there was an altar with a golden calf behind it sitting behind me. And this is what Manasseh did. He built altars for the host of heaven and the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering. How would you like to be a son of Manasseh? Well, son, I, I need to offer to one of the stars, so you're it today. 
while you're still alive, I'm going to cook you to death with fire. He burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom and used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and the necromancers. And he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the idol that he had made, he set up in the house of the God of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land that I have appointed for your fathers, if only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them. All the laws, the statutes, and the rules given through Moses, which is amazing. Because what is Manasseh doing? Out of those laws and statutes that God gave to Moses, isn't he breaking like the first half? No idols, no graven images, no other gods. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. Imagine if this was the description of your rule. That your rule, your, uh, the nation under your leadership was even more wicked than the people God destroyed before you. But it doesn't end there. In the following verses of this chapter, chapter 33 of 2 Chronicles, Manasseh, when he and the kingdom are threatened by Assyria, he actually repents of his idolatry and actually returns to God, restoring the temple, removing the idols. But by the end of chapter 33, it records that Manasseh's son Ammon was worse than Manasseh. So much so that God put Ammon to death. And on the heels of such wickedness, God places Josiah on the throne of Judah at the tender age of eight. Chapter 43 of 2 Chronicles and verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. We are in the middle of a political season. And there has been great evil under this current regime. And imagine, finally, the results of the election come in and it seems like we have a good leader. Would it make you just stop and breathe a sigh of relief? And that's where chapter 34, verse 1 leaves us. But the problem is the reforms are never enough. Really what this is building up to for us to understand as we will look at in chapter 17 of Jeremiah, is that God requires heart replacement, not reform, because our hearts are desperately wicked. The reason why the reforms of Manasseh didn't stick and his son comes on the scene and is even more wicked, so much so that God kills him, because Ammon's heart was desperately wicked and so were the people. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 to 10. We read them in our scripture reading. This is our state. This is our natural state. This is the heart we have inherited from Adam. A deceitful heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Or you could even describe it as desperately wicked as the King James renders. Who could even understand it? And I, the Lord, search and test the mind, the heart and the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. God says the heart is wicked, and the only one who can understand it is me and me alone, and I repay for what your heart does, what your mind thinks. That should scare us a bit. We're pretty good about being pretty decent on the outside. 
most of us. But if only people knew the thoughts we thought and the heart desires we had. And God does. And this is why God requires us to have a new heart, as Jeremiah describes, uh, as, as uh, we'll find in another book in the Old Testament. Without a new heart, we just have this old heart that is so desperate and so wicked. No reform can fully uh, affect it. No reform can fully change it from bad to good, from desperately wicked to righteous. And so God, though He is merciful, though He is gracious, His mercy and grace requires heart replacement, not reform, because our hearts are desperately wicked like that of Manasseh and Ammon. Second Chronicles chapter 34 continues the narrative for us. And it tells us that Josiah in his reign, starting at eight years old, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. A good king, yes, celebrate. We should be glad of it and thank God for good leaders. We should should vote for them. We should desire them. We should hold them in prayer, even the bad ones. And Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He walked in the ways of David, his father. He did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. For the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram and the carved and the metal images. He's getting rid of the idolatry. This is much like just very recently for us when the Supreme Court finally struck down the death sentence for the innocent and removed abortion as a national right. That should have given us cause to celebrate, to see at least in a small way, goodness and righteousness and protection of the innocent for those made in the image of God like us. This is cause for rejoicing. He's purging uh, the idolatry. Skip down to uh, verse 14. Part of the reform of Josiah is not only a purging of the idols, getting rid of them, it's also rebuilding of the temple. And imagine going along, if if we had come in this afternoon, and especially uh, as illustrative with, with the renovations being done on the building, That we come in and find a copy of the Bible. We've been coming to worship God and not using the Word of God. And that is what is going to happen here. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. What a wonderful revelatory idea that we use God's word. They were so far away that it's amazing they found the word of God. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. And then Verse 18, it picks up. Then Saphan, the secretary, told the king, Josiah, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. I don't know what to do with it. It's some weird book. I've not seen anything like it. And Saphan read from it before the king. And the king heard the words of the law and he tore his clothes. This is the right response. Because Judah is in uh, error. Judah it has violated the covenant of God. They deserve all the curses there in the end of the book of Deuteronomy. 
and in great sorrow and, and great show of repentance, the king tears his clothes to show his great grief over sin. And because they found God's word, then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahakim, and the son of Shaphan, Adon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. Go ask God, is the curse is going to come true? Can you imagine how different it would be if, if we had been meeting together and trying to worship God together without the Word of God? And then finally we come in this morning and up in, in the rafters they had finally found a copy. And how amazingly it would be different to finally have it and, and to read what God has said. Even troubling as it was for Josiah. He sends these men out. Go, inquire the Lord for me, for those who are left in Israel and Judah. Find out if God is going to keep his curses. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those with whom the king had sent went to Heldulah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, son of Harash, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second court. It gives us all these historical details. And they spoke to her to that effect, and she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, the king, send word back to him. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah. Isn't that wonderful news? Josiah, all your reforms are working. Isn't it wonderful? And God is still going to judge. Go tell the king, all the curses are coming true. But notice the mercy and grace of God in verse 25. Because they have forsaken me and because they've made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger in all the works of their hands, therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Verse 26 tells us, But to the king of Judah, who sent to inquire the Lord thus, you shall say to him that these things will happen after he's gone. Did Josiah have some great reforms? He's refurbishing the temple. But it's not enough. He, he's reading the word of God. It's not enough. Second thing we see here is that God, merciful and gracious, requires heart replacement, not reform, because our hearts are naturally idolatrous, replacing God. The reason God gives through the prophetess there in verse 25 is because they have replaced me. The curses are coming true because the people have replaced me. They've forsaken me and made offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger with the works of their hands. God requires replacement because our hearts are naturally idolatrous. We naturally replace God with anything and everything. Verse 25, they have forsaken me and made offerings to others, God, other gods. We do the same thing. Reform is not enough. Our nation has replaced God. We so often have done that. Our nation has replaced God with men of parties. 
we have replaced God with men of parties or with 401ks or with entertainment. And we've made offerings to these things instead of worshiping God alone. Jeremiah chapter 2. God's message through Jeremiah to the people says, And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. I Didn't I do good for you? God gives them a history lesson. Didn't I bring you out of Egypt? Didn't I bring you into a land of plenty? A place as other verses, other passages describe. I brought you in. You didn't even have to plant. All you had to do is pick what was already growing and ripe. A land of plenty, a land of milk and honey. But what happened? When you came in, you defiled the land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. All those who should have known God, who should have been proclaiming God, who should have been leading the people to God, had gone astray and were leading the people astray. The priests didn't even know who God was. The ones, the Levites, who were to teach the law didn't even know it. The prophets, the ones who should have said, thus says the Lord, were saying, here's what Baal says. They all went after things that do not profit. Therefore I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children I will contend. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and see or send to Kadar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Go look at these other nations. See if anything like this has happened. Specifically, has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Go to all these idolatrous nations, Judah, and see if there's another place that has swapped out their gods. And they're not even real. But you've swapped out your glory for that which does not profit. You got rid of God for, for a hunk of wood that can do nothing for you. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Why? For my people have committed two evils. What are the two evils they've committed? They have forsaken me. The fountain of living waters and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God illustrates what they've done, this replacement of him, their glory for, for idols. This way, he says, they've forsaken me, and I'm a spring of living water, fresh, pure, thirst-quenching. And instead, they went and chiseled out a cistern out of rock, and as they did so, they broke it so it doesn't even hold water. What little water collects on the bottom is just that nice little pond scummy water. Isn't that so refreshing? Wouldn't you like to go and scoop some, some, some green water, nice and thick and gooey, and drink that? when there's a beautiful, pure stream right next to it. They made themselves cisterns that could hold no water. They, they, they made for them gods that could do nothing for them. Now, if you were thirsty, what would you like? Pond scum or fresh water? I think I would go with the fresh water, but our hearts so naturally go for the pond scum. 
And this is well, the reason God, as merciful and gracious as He is, requires our heart to be replaced and not reformed because our hearts so quickly replace God with the things that cannot satisfy. The broken cistern. The pond scum. 2 Chronicles continues the narrative for us of the events going on in Je Jeremiah's day. And I find this especially telling and especially heart-wrenching. says, Josiah, in chapter 35, verse 1, kept a Passover to the Lord. That's great. Isn't that wonderful? They're returning to the law. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month, right on time, right when they're supposed to do it. And chapter 18 of this description of them keeping the Passover tells us, no Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. And really, the way it reads in the original Hebrew, since before the days of Samuel the prophet. Even since the first Passover. And this is the nation who had David as their king, who had Solomon, and still this Passover is in no comparison to that. They don't even match up to this Passover. None of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover, not even the good kings, not even David who was after God's heart, not even Solomon his son. No such Passover had been kept as was kept by Josiah and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and the Israel who were present in the inhabitants of Jerusalem. sad thing is, even as they're trying to return to God, as national reform is happening, Josiah ha has declared they're going to keep the Passover. He sent out an edict to all the people, even to the, the remnants of Israel in the northern kingdom that's already been destroyed by Assyria, that they have to keep it as well. But the problem is, as Jeremiah tells us in, in his book, that some of the people then thought that keeping such things was enough to keep God. If we just do religion externally like God said, then, then that's enough. If we just do our religious obligations, then God will be happy enough. Judgment won't come. But what we find is that God, merciful and gracious, requires heart replacement, not reform, because our hearts prefer to trust in external religion instead of the Almighty God. They started trusting in the reforms that had happened instead of the one who called them back. Isn't that what we can do so easily? Well, if our nation just has a good leader and will turn, then maybe God's judgment will be averted. We start trusting in the right leader instead of in the one who places him there. This is why we have to have a change of heart instead of reforms. Without that change of heart, the reforms are worthless. The reforms never go far enough. Jeremiah chapter 7, the first 15 verses. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord. All right, Jeremiah, you're a priest. Go stand in the gate of the temple so that everybody that comes in is going to hear. All you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord, listen. Pay attention. Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. But do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The prevailing attitude in Jeremiah's day, even this is after Josiah, is that, well, because we have the temple of God, God won't let us be destroyed. This is one of two temples that is destroyed on that very place. This is Solomon's temple uh, rejuvenated under Josiah. Fresh coat of paint. Maybe some new carpets, a couple new curtains. It's been rehabilitated. But they started trusting in the symbol versus in the one who is to dwell there. And they said, well, we've got the temple of the Lord. God surely won't judge us. He won't destroy us. We've got the temple. Where would God go if his house is destroyed? Of course, they forget that God does not dwell in a house built with hands. And there were prophets, false prophets, opposing Jeremiah in his message, saying, well, we have the temple of the Lord. That's where this phrase comes from. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They were using that. God's message is, for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice, one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, or the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not, do, do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave you of old to your fathers forever. Notice all the extra sin coming with their idolatry. Oppression. Taking advantage of widows and the fatherless. Many people in our day are are clamoring to old ideas of socialism and communism because they see the ills of capitalism. And neither one are the answer. They're an effect of unregenerated, unreplaced hearts. All the ills of both flow out of hearts that need to be replaced. Just as here in this passage, the idolatry of the people had overflowed into their social relationships. God says, if you will live by my law, correct your ways, I'll even let you live here. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail, whether deceptive words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go out and do all these abominations. The book of James tells us that the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. One of the best illustrations of this is a guy trying to sit on a fence. It's very uncomfortable. Here the people are trying to sit on the fence between God and the the gods they like. Their own gods that they've chosen. Oh, they go and do, and really worship the Baals and do that, but then, oh, well, we'll we'll come in and and check the, the time card for God. We'll come into the temple, do the sacrifice, ching, ching. Okay, let's go back. Their conduct was inconsistent with a heart that followed God. They went out, they stole, they murdered, they committed adultery, they they offered to idols, and then they come into the temple like, like nothing is wrong. They come and say, oh, God's delivered us. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh. You think you're going to get by because you have the house of God? Where is the tabernacle? 
This is referencing 1 Samuel chapter 4. The tabernacle came to rest in Shiloh. It plays a prominent place there in the beginning of 1 Samuel with Hannah and Eli, with young Samuel, Samuel being presented after God answered Hannah's prayer. And in 1 Samuel 4, Shiloh, the ark of God goes out from Shiloh and is captured by the Philistines when God kills the two sons of Eli. And when the word comes back to Shiloh, Eli falls over dead. And even during the, the, the good influence of Samuel as prophet and the last judge of Israel, Shiloh fades from national prominence. So that by the time uh, of David, even of Saul, people don't go to Shiloh anymore to worship God. Likely, it fell into disrepair. It diminishes and ceased to be the place of the presence of God. And God here is telling in Jeremiah's day, do you go to Shiloh anymore? I can do the same thing here in Jerusalem. See what I did to it where I made my name dwell at the first. See what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, your murders, your stealing, your offering to the bales, your oppression of the sojourner, your, your taking advantage of the wicked and the fatherless, because you've all done all these things, declares the Lord, when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen. And when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers as I did to Shiloh. And even more so, Babylon comes in. Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple. He carries off all the articles of worship. They were trusting in a building. They were trusting in an outward manifestation, an external religion over having their heart replaced by God. Worst of all, and I will cast you out of my sight. As I cast out your kinsmen, all the offspring of Ephraim, the northern kingdom. You thought you got off. The northern kingdom was destroyed. You thought you averted crisis. Assyria is in decline. God's got Babylon lined up to come and to destroy. Because we need a replacement of our hearts. Because so often... Our hearts prefer to trust in external religion instead of the Almighty God. Oh, I go to church. I do the religious thing. I punch my religious time card. But then go out and commit murders and stealings and oppression. Worship other gods. The message of Jeremiah is not an overly happy one. The people never had their heart replaced. They wouldn't got, allow God to do it. The hope we'll see next week in, a, in part two is that God offers us the replacement of our heart, the new covenant, where he writes his law on our hearts. And instead of external religion, instead of idolatry, instead of wickedness, we have new hearts that love God, that respond, that are struck by sorrow when we sin. 
And the answer to the question we began with is, we need replacement, not reform. Our nation, ourselves. Reforms won't do enough. No matter how good a leader comes upon the scene this next election, it won't be enough. We might say, well, I trust in our military, our military, our military. They can be defeated. And so what are you praying for as we even go through this season? Are you praying for a reform of our nation or the replacement of hearts in our nation, starting with us? Do you just want reform? Make it better temporarily? Or do you want it to change? For our nation to be awakened again as it has been twice before. Where the word of God affects hearts and changes them. So that we become followers of God instead of of our idols. Are you praying for reform or replacement of hearts in our nation? And really, even more personally, are you trying to reform your wicked heart? How's that going? There's a reason Paul, under the guidance of God, inspiration, in so many of his books, tells us to put off and put on. Put off the old. Put on your identity in Christ. Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, Philippians. Put this mind in you that is yours in Christ Jesus. Are you trying to reform a wicked heart? Trying to turn over that new leaf only to realize it's the same stupid leaf? Don't you know you need a new leaf? Are you trying to reform your wicked heart? Is it working? Or will you let God give you a new heart today? Jeremiah introduces us to this concept, even though we've had it already with... uh, with the promise of the gospel all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. He introduces us, as we'll get to next week, the idea of this new covenant, where God will write on our hearts His law, His very character. The New Testament expands it to tell us that it's Jesus who gives us a new heart. That's why Jesus, when he is there in the upper room, the last Passover with his disciples, says, this is the new covenant with my blood. This is the new covenant by my broken body for you. We ask God, will you trust him and cry out to him for a new heart? God, forgive me, I am a sinner. Change me, as only you can. Or will you trust reform? Reform that will never go far enough. Will you let God give you a new heart today? Will you ask Him for it? Forgive me, Lord, I am a sinner. I trust you. To give me a new heart. Trust in the payment of Jesus alone for the forgiveness of my sins. Will you do that today? Let's pray. Father, work in our hearts. God, I ask that you destroy our confidence in natural leaders that you would destroy our hope in reforms of our nation. 
that instead we would cry out to you to replace our hearts and the hearts of our fellow citizens. That you begin in us, that we would have new hearts under the new covenant. That be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, replaced. That we could put off and put on as instructed in the New Testament. That we would cease from the futility of trying to reform our sinful, idolatrous, wicked hearts. That you would make us new creations in Christ Jesus. That you would begin with us, that we would share with those around us, our friends and family and neighbors, that they would have new hearts. And that you would awaken this nation once again that we would turn to Jesus alone. And through that, we would avert the disaster that is surely coming. Lord, work in our hearts. Open our eyes to our sinfulness. Make us new. That we might have hope in Jesus alone. We ask in Jesus' name.